for as long as I can remember, I loved poetry, but I didn't know it was poetry. I called it playing with words. Um, I loved the rhyme. I loved rhythm. My mother had loads of poetry. She would never call herself a poet. And it's simply because she comes from a part of Jamaica where they had a lot of poetry. They were, she doesn't like me saying this, but they weren't very literate. And, you know, she learned to read and write, but she didn't read novels and she didn't read poetry. But they spoke a lot of poetry and it was very functional poetry. If you wanted to remember a recipe, create a poem, remember it, pass it on to your daughters or your children, your sons, whatever, your friends. If you wanted to remember a you know, political incident, um, create a poem. So my mother would tell me poems all the time. If she wanted me to stop doing something, <laughs> she'd make a little rhyming couplet, you know, and say, remember that. And, you know, I remember remembering the, the months of the year with poems that, you know, we all probably know, things like you know, 30 days of September, okay. April, June and November, all the rest are 31, except for February, long, so 28 day clear and 29 in each leap year. I just remember it uh, because there's something about rhyme and when you put it into a poetic form that kind of lodges in your brain, mm. I think. Mm. So when I started, I didn't really know it was poetry. My mother would never said she, would have, she was a poet, but there was a lot of spoken poetry in the house. At the time, I didn't really think I've got to continue doing poetry because it's important. I just like doing it. Mm. You know, I think we have to be careful when you get to my age and we start doing interviews and stuff like that to over intellectualize mm. it. I like playing with words. Then I discovered that there were some girls that liked me playing with words. So I'd write poems about girls. <laughs> you know, my trick in the playground was to go up to a girl and say, will you give me a kiss if I write a poem about you? And they would go, yes, of course. Then I would just freestyle a poem, get the kiss. So, you know, it was just that. And then poems in the playground and poems in the dance hall, then I started going to clubs. So I started doing poetry over the top of music, you know. And then what happens is I get to experience racism, you know, and to put it bluntly, police brutality. and. I get to understand that the world's not fair and it's not all fun and not all poems are like fluffy things for, 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 to impress girls. And I start writing, you know, much more serious poetry. Although we, even in the early days there was some humour there, but it's a lot more serious. And then it becomes important. But even then I didn't sit down and say, well, this is really important. I was like, this is happened happening to us in the black community. Mm. A lot of white people don't know about it, so I'm going to write a poem about it and shout about it. Mm. Yeah. But who were the people encouraging you? Was it just the audience, the people that you were sharing it with? The only people encouraging me at the time, really, was the audience. Um, you know, and some close friends. My parents weren't. Like, parents that had come from the Caribbean, come to Britain, mm. you know, worked, my father in the post office, my mother is a nurse. They, been, they really didn't have a sense that, you know, you could earn a living as a poet. It, or, you know, they just, it just wasn't mm. in their kind of scope, you know. I remember my mother saying to me, it's wonderful that you do this stuff around your breakfast table and for your friends, but stop it, you know, you're doing too much now and get a job. And I kind of dreamt of being a poet. And she just thought it was crazy. For me... I really wanted to perform. I wanted to get my message out. And um, it was all very much from me. People encouraged me, but even some of the people that were encouraging me found, would find it difficult to say, oh, Benjamin, I'm encouraging you to keep doing this because it's the way you could earn a living. Mm. And to be honest, even in myself, I knew what I wanted to do. I had an idea that maybe I could earn a living from it. Maybe somebody will pay me for it in the future. But actually, that wasn't my motivation. So I couldn't argue with them in a sense. I couldn't say, 
you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to get a job and pay my taxes. <laughs> you know, I'm going I'm to earn a living from this. That w the important thing for me was getting the poetry out, getting it heard, getting our voices that were unheard, getting that voice heard. And so there wasn't really much encouragement from family. There was some encouragement for friends, but only for entertainment purposes. Systems. Toasting on sound systems. So that was toasting, was you creating the poetry or was you just doing it on the spot? It was a mixture of both. And sometimes, you know, you create something on the spot, it worked last night, so you try it again the next night. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the, the important thing was that we were listening to reggae music from the Caribbean, mainly from Jamaica. And a lot of people were imitating what the Jamaicans were doing. What we started doing, first of all, as toasters, and then really as poets, dub poets, was talking about life in Britain now. You know, for Linton, it was life in, Linton Quentin Johnson, it was life in London. For Levi Tafari, it was life in Liverpool. And for Benjamin Zephaniah, it was life in Birmingham. Mm. That's what we started to talk about, what was happening. If somebody got arrested that day, you would hear me talking about it that night on the sound systems. Um, and so, again, you know, we didn't sit down and think this is going to be our role in society and all mm. that stuff. We just found it necessary to a thing to do because nobody else was telling our story. It's interesting. It's like a modern day troubadour. Well, we call ourselves griots, mm. and griots are you know West African poets and musicians that go around from village to village reaching people in the community that the mainstream, mainstream media don't reach and giving an alternative version of the news. Mm. Actually, they're both kind of inter, intertwined mm. because you're probably not old enough to remember in Britain when we had power cuts. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> we used to have power cuts all the time, right? So. Back in the 70s, when we were having all these power cuts, I'd be on the sound system and doing this stuff to music. And then you get a power cut. Now, sometimes you get a power cut in one side of Birmingham, but not in the other. And literally, people just get in their cars and go over to the other side of Birmingham and carry on partying. But sometimes I'd have a stake in the bar. I'd get paid depending on you know how much drink they sold and everything. So I would say to people, no, stay, let me entertain you. Then I would do some poems. I also used to do impersonations, which is a crazy thing to do at these blues dances. I mean, these dances are illegal, right? These dances are where a man and a woman want to get in the corner and whine and grain and, you know, listen to some roots music. Um, so when the power cut goes down, they want to go. But I say, listen, you know, do you want to see me impersonate Mick Jagger? And I was really good at doing a Mick Jagger impersonation or a Bob Marley impersonation. And then I'd put a poem in and then I would just talk about stuff. I was really lucky in that, for some reason, I was interested in apartheid. I was interested in people like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X a long time before it became fashionable. And I used to talk about these things, and kids, people used to come to me and go, boy, you know a lot of things for such a young man. Mm. Um, and so I used to kind of do a kind of performance, lecture, comedy show, poetry show, all kind of mixed together, just to keep the punters there. And then the electricity would come on, and I'd get back on the music. So they were both kind of mixed up. Mm. Well, the word dub comes from reggae. Yeah. And so dub poetry comes from poetry to be spoken over dub. Yeah. And one of its, for me, one of its best characteristics is that it can be performed with dub, with music, or without music. You know, every dub poet you see tends to do both. You know, if they walk in and there's a band, they can do that. And if there's no band, you still feel like you've got a band if they're a really good dub poet. Because they perform, you hear the words, you hear rhythm, mm. and your imagination is engaged. Mm. For me, that's how I define dub poetry. Poetry created for reggae, and it can work with music or without music. Now, there are a lot of dub poets who now shy away from that term simply because we are doing other things. If you look at poetry of mine, like Wrong Radio Station, that's not a dub poet at all, but a dub poem. That's more like jazz funk poem. 
you know, it, 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 drum and bass, it's difficult to define. And that's the thing, you see, we want freedom. Mm -hmm. A lot of dub poets say they're sick of the label because when they sit down to write, they're expected to write dub poetry. And when they don't, somebody goes, oh, you're selling out, you're doing something mm -hmm. different. Well, we're not, we're creative beings, you know. If you're a woman, you want to write some poems about being a woman, but that's probably not all you want to do. And the thing with dub poetry is that <laughs> dub poetry was political. It's based on reggae and all that. So people expect that. And as a poet, you want to grow and do other things. I still like the term dub poetry because it defines my roots. Mm -hmm. But I've grown into a very diverse tree. Oh yeah, it could be quite restrictive. Yes. That's what you're saying. It was kind of like that, but I was also on the run from the police. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Um, so I said, right, I'm going to get, get out of Birmingham and go to London. Um, and, you know, I, I did want to spread my poetry to a wider audience. Everybody in Hansworth had heard me. There was only about three theatres in, in, in Birmingham that would do the book of black poets. And so once I'd done them, that was, that was it. You know, I went back to them and said, can I do a gig here? And they said, well, we had you last year, mm. you know, give it another five years. Mm. So I came to London where things were thriving a lot more. There's a big punk scene and all that kind of thing. So I, I really don't know how I connected with apples and snakes. Um, I, I really don't know. You know, the 70s for me and the 80s, I should say, because it was, I came to London in 1979. So the 80s, was like, you know, some people's 60s. If you can remember it, you weren't there kind of thing. <laughs> or whatever it is they say. <laughs> um, you know, it's a big haze for me. I mean, like, there's, there's, there's... I remember lots of political demonstrations, lots of fiery performances. There's some performances I remember. I can remember the audience and everything. But ask me where it was, I go, oh, I can't remember where it was. Because um, there were just gigs all over London. But I do remember us kind of starting a poetry revolution you know I remember when Apples and Snakes was quite small I remember talking to Paul Beasley and saying you know poets need agents you know they need people to help them organize um, and little things like that and that we wanted to spread there was an interesting scene developing, Lon developing in London but not outside London and I was saying you know I see a future where, you know, we're going to have a vibrant spoken word poetry performance scene in Britain, you know, we kind of talk about those kind of things. I mean, that's kind of happened now. Mm. Um, but back then it was very um, trial and error, experimental readings in pubs with people still serving at the bar, you know, um, readings in venues that kind of weren't suitable and all that kind of thing. But, you know, it was great because we were creating something new. But I really can't remember my relationship with Apples and Snakes when it started. I just knew they were really important. So you, that's interesting because we have you on the 9th of October 1982. Right. And we started, is it 1982? That was the second You were on our gig. second gig. Right. Because I was, there was another guy called Roland Muldoon and he started a thing around the same time and this is why I get confused sometimes, called Alternative Cabaret and um, and then, you see I would perform with Apple the Snake sometimes but a lot of my performances were with, with people like Rick Mayo, Alexis Sale his Alternative Cabaret thing was like you have a poet, you have a juggler, you have a singer you know, it was like, we call it New Variety Variety style, but new anti-racist, anti-sexist variety. And so I do gigs with them as well. But, you know, my gigs with Apples and Snakes are always very good. I remember I did one with Talvin Singh once, which I have on a, on a really badly recorded cassette. You know, Talvin comes in and plays a tabla and we just kind of freestyle it. 
it's just brilliant. And, when, and the moment it finishes, we just finish both together, bang, and the audience go, bang! <laughs> you know, it's just it's great. And um, poor, poor Beasley and his family, you know, he lost his son. Um, but I remember performing and his son kind of walking across and I just picked him up and carried on my performance holding the baby. <laughs> you know. Um, so, yeah, so th th there wasn't that many. I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, there was a lot. But yeah, some poets kind of literally were toured by apples and snakes. Mm. And um, I was busy. I didn't really uh, need that kind of support. Yes, they would contact me directly. Um, yeah, they would just contact me directly. I would organise myself. For a long time, I had no agent or anything like that. And um, just do it myself, you know, phone, not even a mobile phone. <laughs> I get to a landline phone for three o'clock, you call me at five past three, we'll talk about it. And, um, and that was it. And the interesting thing was that in those days, certainly my gigs, and I think this is where I differ from a lot of the other poets, my gigs were advertised in the NME and, uh, and sounds and things like that. My gigs were kind of promoted almost like music gigs were. So um, I think that really made a difference for me. With me. And there's poets like um, Stephen Wells, Stephen Wells, um, Attila the Stockbroker, mm. John Cooper Clark, mm. he's a punk mm. kind of poet who I do a lot of gigs with. That's why, if you look at my early recordings, the first one was called Dub Ranting. They were called ranting poets. Mm. I was called a dub poet. But I could do gigs with both. Mm. So, you know, I'd do Apples and Snake gig, then I would do a kind of ranting gig under punk rock scene and then I'd do a gig for the Rastafarian community, you know, completely black, almost spiritual and religious kind of thing. Um, so I was really fortunate in that way that my poetry kind of crossed mm -hmm. over. I remember, uh, you know, a little bit before then, I think this is 1980, I went to try and get published at a publisher who said, um, we don't do and she, and she said something like, you know, I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to be offensive or anything like that, but we don't publish black or Rastafarian poetry because we just don't understand it and we don't know where its audience is. Now, I kind of understand her not understanding black or Rastafarian poetry, but my issue was that my poetry wasn't all about being black or being, being Rastafarian, you know, and I felt like going, I've got white friends, <laughs> you know, they like my poetry too. <laughs> just like, you know, because I was performing on all different kind of scenes, you know. My early, early performances were all with bands. You know, the first big article ever written about me, I still have it to this day, it was written by the New Musical Express. They gave me a whole page. So this kind of made me slightly different to other poets. You know, I was performing with The Clash, with The Wailers. And then I'd go and do a tea room at the Poetry Society. when it was very different to what it is now. Well, the, the audiences back then were very political, a lot more political than they are now. I mean, my early poetry is, well, I don't like Miss Thatcher, I don't like that girl, her brains I want to splat, that she's the worst girl in the world, I don't like her dictations and her loss on immigration, so I fight in this dimension to build a better nation. You know, and I'd be, I'd be taking up a whole stage, you know. The stage could have room for a band, and I would fill it, you know. On the other hand, if I was restricted, I could just do it here. Um, but the audience loved that kind of me going up and down and I would get into the audience as well. Um, almost like the way that people kind of dive into audiences now. I do that kind of thing because I was kind of crazy at the time. I was angry and it's kind of anarchic at the same time. Poems like This Policeman keep on, Keeps on Kicking Me to Death. It was a very serious subject but at the same time I was taking the mick out of police and their ideas of anti-racism and stuff like that. So, you must understand, when I did This Policeman Keeps On Kicking Me To Death on television, 
for the program called Black on Black. The next day, I tried to go shopping in, in London and I couldn't go. So many people mobbed me, wanted to talk to me, wanted to thank me. A bus driver driving his bus around Piccadilly Circus stopped his bus to get off to hug me. I said, you stop your bus in the middle of the road. He said, I don't care if I get the sack. You're a brother and you're the first brother I've seen on television talking about the way that police treat us. So the audience, the, the audience were hearing things being said which they know go on, sometimes happen to them. I do this policeman kick, keeps on kicking me to death. I remember one night I did it and there's a guy with his arm broken in the audience who's just been beaten up by the police. But people weren't talking about it in the media and so doing it in a gig was important but when I did it on television you know and I, I didn't know until the other day that Trevor Phillips the guy that booked it almost got the sack for it <laughs> you know um but but that's what we were going through so the audience kind of knew that you know and we'd be on stage well I speak for myself I would be on stage and I would say to the audience do you know about Nelson Mandela and then I tell them and I do my poem Free South Africa and I say if you lot care you'll come to the demonstration on Saturday and I used to do things like give somebody something I say give me back on Saturday when, we, when I see you at the, at the demonstration you know and I'd get a posse of them coming people would come um, I mean every other week well, every week there was some kind of demonstration going on so people were just a lot more political mm. I just done a lecture today actually um, about performance poetry back in the day and um, one of the things one of the students said to me is, well, what do you think of the spoken word poets now? And I said, you know, I like them. I think they're great. And I'm not one of these old poets that go, oh, what they do is not, is not poetry and all that stuff. Absolutely not, you know. I mean, I teach from here and um, I bring them here to perform. Um, but sometimes I wish they'd be more political. What they do very well is talk about what it's like for the man them on the street corners and uh, the relationships they have with each other. Mm. I wish they'd be a bit more political. They'd be hear a lot more commentary on, you know, why Black Lives Matter and all that kind of stuff. Having said that, when we were doing poetry, it was very political and we did very little about our relationship with men and women and men and men and women and women and all that kind of stuff. It was all politics. That is why when Thatcher goes, when Mandela comes out, a lot of poets didn't know what to write about. <laughs> they just kind of disappeared, you know, because they were they were kind of what, we, what we, they call in South Africa struggle poets. Mm -hmm. They had to write against something, you know. They didn't know how to write about love. They didn't know how to write about just missing the last bus home. They didn't know how to write about, you know, relationships. Mm. It's interesting, but there's so much fertile material even now yes, of yeah. what's going on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, you yeah. know, there is so much going on in the world now um, that uh, there's so much to write about. Mm. There's so many kind of contradictions, so many crazy things. Um, I was just talking to some poets um, that I know that uh, come from China and um, they're very interested in politics and the way of the direction China's going in, mm. you know, and they want to see, you know, multi-party elections in China, which some people think is impossible. But then they look at us and they go, you get Trump, <laughs> you know, <laughs> instead of working together, you get Brexit, you know what I mean? They look at it and they scratch their heads and go, is that the way democracy works? Mm. And it's very difficult to answer. Mm. You know. Well, there was a time where I was completely against them. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I judged one once. And, um, and funny enough, in the, the one I judged, the person that I judged to be the winner kind of went on to do great things. But... Um, it was that. Trying to remember his name now. Um, it's very tall, um, black guy. Oh, Adisa. Adisa, yeah. yeah. And it was an Apples and Sides gig, I think, in Battersea. 
It was our it was our first apples and snakes poetry competition to find right. the next poet. Right. And we've got you saying this is the next best thing. Is that right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> In the archive. I'm a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Um, no, I, I I did it, and um, so it's a, yeah. I'll start again. So it's a poetry competition slam organised by Apples and Snakes at Battersea, and I judged the decent to be the best poet, and I thought he was great. But the problem is, this is why I feel really guilty about it. I said at the time, I think this is the future, and he's and he's not going to disappear. He's going to be around for a long time. But that didn't mean that the other poets wouldn't and that's where I have a problem you have an audience you can come on you can do nice rhyming you can just capture the, the atmosphere very well and do stuff about the police or whatever else, and the audience love it and then you can come on someone else can come on and do a poem about being tied to the kitchen where she wants to travel the world or something and then the audience at the end just go, oh. yeah, and there's no applause. And so it doesn't register with the judges, you know, but it's a really moving poem, mm. you know. Uh, and who's to say which is best? I hate the term best. I don't like competitions, you know. I have to mark students' poetry here, and I tell them you're not in competition with each other. You know, this is about your performance on the day because I do performance poetry here. I don't mark them by the poetry on the page. It's all about the performance of it. Um, but never in competition with each other, you know. And I never kind of use one against the other, say, you know, well, you know, she's much better than you, or anything like that. Um, poetry is a very old art form. Speaking poetry, people think it's new. It's, it's, it's old. Spoken poetry is older than written poetry. And people that write it, write it because they feel some emotion, they feel some anger, they feel some passion, they feel something about something. Who are we to judge which emotion is more important? You know, and that's why I have a problem with it. I've eased up a little bit. I've said, you know, it, it gets poetry out there and it, and you know, it gets people engaged in poetry. But that's about all it does really. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I don't like slam poetry off, but I think it's limited in, ten, in a sense, it's kind of entertainment. Well, first of all, I would say I don't think of it as a career. Mm -hmm. Because then you start writing for money and you start thinking, you know, this is the best way of earning money. And actually, you've got to write from the heart. Yeah. Let the career happen later. Yeah. So forget the career thing, just write passionately. Then I would say, you know, write passionately, write honestly. Don't think about the trends. Trends come and trends go. And, you know, like I t said earlier, uh, there was a trend for writing struggle poetry in the eighties, anti thatcher poem and all that kind of stuff. Um, that kind of disappeared. We still want political poetry, but you know, it's it's kind of it's not the cool poetry anymore. You know, there's loads of other things that are just as cool. Um, so yeah, uh, and then I would say, um, read poetry, read poetry, and listen to poetry. I get too many up and coming poets that go, "Yeah, I'm a poet. I want to be a poet," and then I go, "Well, what do you know about poetry?" And I think, do you read poetry? No. Mm. Then they show me something and they think they're being really original. And I go, well, Keats did that hundreds of years ago or, or whatever, you know. Understand a little bit of your antecedents. You don't have to be an expert, but just understand the, the poetry family. Understand where you're coming from. Understand what some other poets are doing. And I guess the last thing I would say, and I would say this because I'm biased, that perform it if you can. You know, I'm not sure what you mean by a career in writing. Some people in poetry, some people just think of, you know, writing books. Uh, some people think write books and then perform. I say, get on any stage you can. When I started, I had so many rejections because I was told that what I had to do 
was get published. And I tried to get published. And I had all these people talking about my poetry and I thought they didn't understand it. And then I realised they don't understand it because they haven't heard it. And then I started performing. And then I had, oh, I don't want to say crew, but I had all those poet publishers at my mercy. They all came back to me mm. saying, wow, we rejected you, but we're hearing about you on the television, on the news. And, and you know, it, it, it's hard for people to understand now. God, I'm going to sound like a bloody wanker. <laughs> it's hard for people to understand now how big I was. You know what I mean? I was, a f I was on television yeah. in between programs just doing a poem. Um, I was on the radio with John Peel and stuff like that. I remember one night I wanted to be on my own and I came home to my house and you only had three television channels and I turned on BBC One, I was on. I turned on BBC Two, two I was on. I turned on ITV and I was on. And I was so hurt at the time because I thought I just want to be on my own and, and the country's watching me. Um, so, um, I forgot what I'd say now. <laughs> I was talking, well, what? About I'll, performing. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. All right, let me get back into the groove. Right, so, I, the publishers had rejected me. I'd gone out and started performing. So I was on television, I was on radio. All these publishers were kind of at their house at night, turning television on, going, isn't that the guy we rejected? Mm -hmm. So they all came back to me, and then I could go, right, watch the deal. One publisher would give me a deal, and i go, right, I'll be back in a moment. i go to another publisher, they've given me this deal, what can you do? Can you do better than that? And I really played them against each other. Um, but it was all about getting on stage, and when there's a wave of people supporting you on the grassroots, there's nothing like it. The publishers had to listen. They had to take notice. And they all came back and apologised. Um, so now I've never had to go to a publisher. You know, I have them lined up. Sorry, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but the point is, get out there, do good work. And if you can get an audience for your poetry, everything else will come. Mm. The career will come. The work will come. You know, and you'll just get better at your craft. But you, you have to understand that there's a business side to it. But you've got to concentrate on your craft. Mm. And everything else will fall into place. Mm. As, as I understand it from the module guys that I've seen from the other universities, they do performance poetry, but you can just study it and write about it, or you can perform it, whatever. With my module, it's all about the performing. So <laughs> there's no real studying of a poet unless you want to, to help you. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of that. But 70% of your marks are about the performance you do. 30% is like a journal that you write about your journey. Um, I remember when I started it, I said that I think it's the only module like this in the country. Mm. And I got people from the Caribbean and from Asia saying, I think it's the only module like it in the world, actually. All about the performance. Kind of m not really academic at all. Um, and, um, and sometimes it gets very personal because I want the students to really dig deep. So the girls, when they come, usually they start, it's all boyfriend poems. <laughs> now, by the time they go, it's feminist poems and poems about their relationship with their parents and stuff like this. The guys, especially if they've got a bit of rap background, they think, oh, memorising poetry is easy, I can do that, and I can drop rhythms and stuff like that. And then for them, I want them to dig deeper and, you know, and talk about things that are much more personal and universal at the same time, all those kind of things, you know. So I have a lot of boys come in and they big up their chest and they can perform well. And now I say, right, okay, what do you think of your father? Mm. <laughs> you know, something like that. Mm. Um, and that throws them, of course, because they can do what they think of girls, they can do what they think of the police and all that stuff, you know. Ask them a question like that and it throws them. And if they can't answer, even better. I say, you know, write about it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's all about the performance. There's other modules here that do, you know, studying one poet or another or writing poetry.
but I'm only interested in the performance. And in the performance, can you talk about the importance of the voice, the performance voice? Um, yeah, I mean, it's all about that. I mean, for me, one of the things that a lot of performance poets do, which kind of hinders the performance a bit, is that they write a poem about something. Let's say they write a poem about refugees. And at the time they write it, you know, they're really angry and they're really passionate about something and they really feel something deeply. And then when they come to perform it, they become shy or something. And they don't perform it with the venom and the passion and the fire. And I keep telling my students that now, how did you feel when you performed, when you wrote it? And they'll tell me, and I go, right now I want to see that. You know? And that can be a lot of hard work because some students say, well, when I wrote this, I was crying. I go, right, I'll cry. Mm. If you have to, but just go back to that original emotion. Yeah. Um, and, and so if they, you know, just say this person wrote a poem about refugees. If they wrote a poem, another poem about, um, let's say their relationship with their father, um, it may not be so angry. So they use a different voice for that. You know, how do you express that emotion? How were you feeling at the time of that? You know? I get it. Sometimes we get students from the theatre and they almost overperform. <laughs> you know what I mean? And for them, I say, come on, get it down. Think about the words and expressing the words now. You know, this is not acting. Um, and so it's almost a reverse, you know, I mean, I want to bring them back down um, because they feel they've got to overdo it. The idea of performing a poem in front of the audience is that you are able to really express the poem. And an important part of that is making contact with the audience. It may even be moving around the stage, depending on the poem but certainly making eye contact with the audience. Mm. Now you make eye contact with the audience best if you have nothing in your hands, nothing looking down on, and you, you're really just looking at the audience and you're just going for it. Some people feel the need to have notes, have the poem in front of them. I say that's okay, but don't let it hinder your performance. Now some people are good at that, some people could just have the poem in the hand and still be performing and just go mm. and just carry on doing it. Mm. When you're doing this, uh, where was I? Spending a long time there and then looking up. You're reading a poem, mm. you're not really performing it. Mm. And that's the difference, I think. Yeah. When you've committed it to memory, you have the freedom then to put your whole body and soul into it. When you're holding the papers and referring to the poem, it can hold you back. Not all the time. There's some good poets that have the notes with them. Some poets just like something to hold on to. In the old days, it used to be a fag, a cigarette, you know. A poet just hold a cigarette. I've seen poets come on stage and they haven't actually smoked a cigarette. It's just a light, you know, and they just need something to touch, something to hold. So, but I've always found my best performance. Well, I don't read from the page anyway, because it just, I'm dyslexic and it just holds me back so much. Um, but for me, it's all about the eye contact you have with the audience. Mm. One thing I love about the poetry audience, you know, and I think when you talk about poets over the years in Apples and Snakes, you also have to big up the audience because they were going to poetry gigs when they weren't that popular. Mm. And one thing I can say about them is they didn't care if you were black, white, gay, straight, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, anarchist, whatever. Mm. Have you got words to move me? You know? Can you warm me tonight? You know, and that's the thing I love about poetry audiences. Over the years, a couple of people have tried to manufacture poets and it hasn't worked. The audience can see through it. Well, I'm going to die one day. That's <laughs> probably going to happen. Before that happens. <laughs> Before that happens. I don't know. I was thinking of myself. I'm thinking of myself today. <laughs> I think about myself all the time. 
And I thought, gosh, you know, I've just been doing some work for the Open University and Human Rights. I'm Professor of Poetry here at Brunel. I'm visiting Professor at De Montfort. I've just been doing lectures there. Am I just going into academia? Fortunately, I have an album coming out soon, so it's a band and back on the road again. So, you know, I'll probably have some sex and all that kind of stuff. I, you know, just to, um, I love what I do and I just want to do more of it better. I don't have any other major ambitions. I think all my ambitions, as they were back in the day, are all political and so they're not much to do with me. I just want to play my part in them. If you'd asked me a long time ago, what were the dream things I wanted to do? Uh, one was get a state for the black South Africans. Mm. Um, and they have that, and a stake for the Palestinians, and that's not happening yet. Um, but now it's even broadened to, you know, look, I wrote ref a, a novel called Refugee Boy. Mm. I know we're supposed to be talking about poetry, but I think I wrote it 15 years ago or something. Mm. Mm. My publisher tells me that the sales have gone through the roof. I should be happy about that, but I'm not because it's all about the fact that people think it's a mm. recent book. <laughs> And it's so relevant today, and I'm thinking, God, that's really depressing. You know, I was just telling my students about, it, like, I didn't think, if you'd asked me in the 80s about, you know, 2016, we'd have organisations like Black Lives Matter or even UKIP. I was like, no, no, we really dealt with that issue a long time ago. So my ambitions are kind of just to help with the causes that I feel passionately about, you know. I really want people to just live together. I always say that, you know, if we could all live together, all the religions and the different people, different way of thinking, if we, call a, if we, if we all learn to accommodate each other, mm -hmm. then Benjamin Zeff and I would probably have been a comedian. Yeah, I like making people laugh and I love entertaining people. I just started doing it with words. Mm -hmm. And it was just because of the state of the world that made me get serious. Yeah. Otherwise, I would just be having fun and, um, I would, I would have gone back, or I would, or I would have stayed at the reason why I came to poetry in the first place, playing with words. Mm. Um, but the way of the world means that I got to fight with words as well. <laughs>